And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, where it is finally time to wrap up the least popular gimmick of podcasting in 2020. So, where the hell were we? And we're going to go rapid fire through our version of the Delete 8, the eight teams we have not yet done on this podcast. And to wrap it up, I think I can call you the MVP of So Where the Hell Were They. Uh, Seattle Kraken fanboy, Kevin Pelton, how are you? I'm doing well, yeah. Uh, certainly from a volume standpoint. I don't think efficiency. Stan got me for sure on efficiency and, and Hollinger too, but uh, uh, volume, I'm, I'm doing quite well. Stan, I can just let him hope. I don't even have to be on the podcast. He's just <laughs> bringing every stat. I can just go like go for a walk and Stan Van Gundy can do the low post podcast. Uh, how much Kraken merchandise have you purchased already? I have not yet purchased any Kraken merchandise. It's a, it was a limited selection because they didn't want the name to leak out. That's kind of the amazing thing in 2020 that you can do a team name, a logo, and everything and not have it break beforehand. Um, no, that, that, that is very impressive. I, I, I'm lukewarm, but you know I'm happy that Seattle's getting a, a sports team, another sports team, obviously. And um, they have maybe the best WNBA team. And the W is up and running. And um, the game's ratings are up. They're kicking ass. Uh, and Sue Bird just keeps on trucking. Cover of Slam Magazine. Unbelievable. Um, their, their interim coach, Gary Kloppenberg, said last night he thought that she could still shoot when she's 90, which, you know, I'm hoping Sue keeps playing a while. I don't know if I'm counting on 90. Uh, she'll still be able to shoot. I don't know if she'll be able yeah. to shoot in the context of a professional basketball game, but she'll, <laughs> Sue Bird will be able to shoot when no matter what. Okay, uh, we we drafted, um, we each get to lead the discussion on four of these teams or explain the one thing we are most interested in about these teams. Uh, we had a draft, although it was not so much as a draft in that you just preemptively claimed the Orlando Magic as the number one pick, and I went down from there. So, Mr. Pelton, you have selected Orlando uh, number one. They are 30 and 35 and eighth in the East. A good bet to pass the Brooklyn Nets, uh, or what remains of the Brooklyn Nets, who did not really fare well in this draft, um, to move up to seventh. Why did you select, why were you so eager eager to steal the, that team that frankly would have been my number one pick Jonathan Isaac and I don't know if that's so far off from your reason too it was so exciting to see him on the court I think that was Monday that they played their last scrimmage game the first time since he got hurt on New Year's Day which feels like has been several decades since that took place and he was such an exciting player to watch the first couple months of the season defensively the the growth that he made at that end of the court in in some respects physically like you know, he was he was always very tall when he came to the league, but somehow he looks even taller and more monstrous now, despite being skinny, and was just swallowing people up defensively. Uh, I think you wrote the other day that he would have been in line for all defensive consideration had he stayed healthy. No I question. felt the same way. Uh, w- one thing I looked up here, uh, according to the, the rim protection data on NBA advanced stats, he had the 15th lowest opponent field goal percentage inside fi- five feet as a primary defender at 51.4%. And that may not sound that amazing, but everyone ahead of him, except for Giannis, who leads the league, which is why he was... Giannis is... When they have there. that... When they show that set for Giannis, it should just be like a, a, a laughing icon. It's so much ridiculous. <laughs> it's so ridiculously lower than everybody else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe a Matumbo finger wig gif, maybe? Yeah they, yeah, they should just not even show the number. It's just really low. But everyone else in that group that's ahead of him, besides Giannis, is primarily a center. So for Isaac to be supplying that kind of dream protection is a power forward is an incredible thing. And I think, you know, we'll see how much he actually plays in this format. But it gives the Magic a chance to be a better team, I think, than they've been over the course of the season. Yeah, he didn't start... Um their scrimmage games, or the, I think he only appeared in one of the scrimmage games, maybe. Uh, he, right. he did not start, um, nor did Markel Fultz. Uh, so this is a team that was absolutely blistering on offense when the season stopped. They had, were the number one in the league, I think, at scoring after February 15th. If you look at their schedule, that feat becomes a little bit less impressive. There are not many elite defensive teams on that stretch of the schedule, but still, it mirrored their development last season when they kind of surged toward the end. Um so, but they but they enter with like two starting lineup spots kind of um, in question. So, it, it, James Ennis had been starting toward the end. That would presumably be Jonathan Isaac's spot next to Aaron Gordon. 
Uh, we don't know what's going to happen there. I suspect Ennis will open as a starter. Markel Fultz started essentially all year. And DJ Augustine, uh, as their backup, meshed was part of these lineups with him and Michael Carter-Williams and Terrence Ross that were just blowing the doors off of teams toward the end of the season. That maybe gets broken up if Augustine continues to start. Fultz was late to come to the bubble and is sort of ramping up. Then you have Fultz and Michael Carter-Williams together, which seems like maybe too little shooting for like the NBA of 2010, let alone 2020. Um, so they enter with a lot of interesting questions, right? I mean, for a team that was sort of surging toward the end, they have a lot of sort of mini question marks, I guess. Yeah, and I think the Fultz versus Augustine question is probably the most animating one because it's to some extent, what are we as a franchise? What are our goals right now? What are we trying to do? Because DJ Augustine, if you're trying to win a basketball game in July 2020, is almost certainly your better option. As exciting as it was to see Markel Fultz back on the court full time this year, to see him actually attempting jump shots, uh, you know, it was very encouraging. He, because of the fact that he wasn't able to mo- knock down very many threes, was not a particularly efficient scorer, not a great starting point guard. And Augustine, even though he's more of kind of a stopgap and uh, a free agent, I believe, at the end of this season, you know, he's, if you're really trying to make some noise in these seeding games and then in the first round of the playoffs, he gives you the better hope of doing so. Uh, it will be interesting. And they've been great when they played together, by the way. They're plus, if I'm re- reading this right, they're plus 68 in about 230 minutes with Fultz and DJ uh, together at the same time. I just wonder, you know, if you look at the numbers, th- there are games where you look at the – leave aside the guards for a second. And obviously that's hard. Fultz is the biggest question mark in the entire league still, maybe. Um, there are games when you watch – the Isaac Gordon Vucevic super gigantic front court. Who's the three? Who's the four? It doesn't matter. And it, and it makes sense because Vucevic is a really good shooter for a center. And so you kind of invert the positional jobs and all of that. Gordon and eventually Isaac are kind of multi-skilled offensive players. Isaac, I think, has the ambitions of working off the dribble a little bit here and there and can do it. Um, and you see glimpses of it working. The numbers over two seasons are up and down and probably net out as about even over the last two seasons. So I ask you, KP, that's obviously a huge question for their future, right? Like is Aaron Gordon and Jonathan Isaac and a a center of any kind going to work for us? When you watch those three play together, what do you watch for and what are your thoughts on the viability of it going forward? I guess it's, you know... Can you, it's probably can you get enough shooting from those three guys? And in particular, I think Gordon is the swing guy there. Like, I'm not counting on Isaac to be a plus shooter. He probably doesn't need to be given everything he's doing defensively. But, you know, Gordon, you, you mentioned Isaac having aspirations of doing things all the, off the dribble. That's always been what Gordon has wanted to do. He sold himself from the, I think there was Paul George comparisons, sold himself from the start as a small forward, someone who would play with the ball in his hands. And that has just not been his game. I think something, you know, we've discussed in the low post before has been a, a longtime theme of him, of yours, because it's been such a fascinating thing that he's got this potential to be a really nice complimentary role player if he would just embrace that he should be a role man in the pick and roll play defense and not worry about trying to create his own shot yeah i'm i'm obsessed with a lot of things about the orlando magic it's it's a little it's a little strange to be honest i love watching the orlando magic i love thinking about them kevin clark uh, of the ringer and i have discussed this quite a bit offline uh, my magic obsession Fultz just dialed it up to like 11 because how can you not be obsessed with Markel Fultz? But a lot of it comes down to like, I just think Aaron Gordon has the potential to be an important part of a championship caliber team. Like I just, I think he's, I think Aaron, the the Aaron Gordon on the right roster can be on the floor in game seven of the NBA finals someday. And I just haven't seen that kind of player consistently. You see it here and there, but you know, the bottom line is for this season, they play Brooklyn right out of the gate. Uh, in in the in Orlando, the home they're the home team. They should get all the home games, um, and it would be shocking to me, and I assume to you, if they did not pass Brooklyn and move up to seventh. I mean, I'm fascinated because you know I keep running these simulations of the seeding games in the playoffs, and even though Orlando has the much better rating, just because of the randomness factor and the fact that they're a half game back in the standings, 
they don't pass Brooklyn nearly as often as you would think they would do. I think the last run I did, it ended up like 53, 47. I read your column today too, with all the simulations and, and I would folk, I guess I was focused so much on Memphis and the eighth seed in the West that I just, I guess I just, here I am hours later, I forgot. <laughs> you know, it it just didn't register with you because of the fact that it seemed so unthinkable. So I, that may be one where just the numbers can't capture quite how uh, limited this Brooklyn roster is to say the least. Okay, let's go on to my number two draft pick. I was given the second pick in the draft once you hogged the first pick at like a, some sort of um, dictator and took the Orlando Magic from me. And then you had the nerve to mock my choice for the second pick <laughs> as being overdrafted, and that is the San Antonio Spurs, uh, who enter at, let me see here, 27 and 36 and that little 27 is a big deal because the two teams above them are 28 and 36 that's New Orleans and Sacramento so the Spurs are at a disadvantage I saw they made the playoffs in I think fewer than 10 percent of your simulations Um, so I don't exactly have high expectations for the Spurs why I'm excited for the Spurs is because uh, the void left by LaMarcus Aldridge and Trey Lyles, their starting front court for most of the season, is going to open minutes for Jakob Pertl, who has been spectacular off the bench and had he played more minutes would have been a viable six-man of the year candidate. And um, they have been starting, not only are we seeing the much-coveted white whale of the NBA, the DeJounte murray Derek White minutes, they're starting together and they're starting with Lonnie Walker, who is an absolute speed demon in transition. And I have to say, he didn't get to play much. Um, He he didn't get to play much, but I liked uh, Keldon Johnson. I I like his physicality. I like his ability to switch and move around positions. Um, I'm excited to see all of these guys because, you know, um, they're all kind of wingy point, whatever you call Murray. He's a giant point guard. He has the body of a wing. They're all wingy, and the Spurs are in this weird spot now where they have sustained kind of their mediocre team. They have they, they they lost Kawhi and they're mediocre. And you look at their roster and you look at the giant questions they have at power forward and center going forward. Pirtle's a free agent, and you sort of start to ask like, how are they? So they're mediocre. They've hit mediocrity. Presumably, they don't want to fall down to sub mediocrity, and they want to go back up towards the top. That jump, once you fall to mediocrity, to go back up without going down is really, really hard. And we're going to learn a ton about these perimeter guys. I'm excited to watch all of them. I hope all four of them play together. All right, this is fair. You've made a strong case for taking yes! number two. I've maybe been primed as a Seahawks fan to uh, complain about overdrafting and in terms of value on the board. But they they were not number two on my, admittedly, despite uh, the White Murray backcourt, as you mentioned. They played 102 minutes together during the entire regular season. They played almost a th- or more than a third of that total. I, I guess precisely a third of that total. I can do this math off the top of my head. In the scrimmages, they played 34 minutes together in the last three games. So clearly we're going to get a lot better sense of whether those two guys can play together. And it's kind of the same thing as we were just talking about with Augustine and Fultz. Like, if you were the San Antonio Spurs trying to win basketball games during the 2019-20 season, the best thing you could do is make sure there was a shooter, either Bryn Forbes or Patty Mills, on the court with DeJounte Murray and Derek White at all times to make sure that you cover up a little bit for their weaknesses and you know don't emphasize those weaknesses by putting them together. But eventually those guys are going to be your backcourt of the future you think you know or or play large roles in it maybe it's them one of them and lonnie walker uh depending on what happens with Keldon johnson and some other things but you got to see whether they can play together at some point and it does seem like the aldridge injury and the fact that there's such long shots to make the playoffs has kind of forced the spurs to accept a reality about themselves that it seemed like they were unwilling to accept before yeah let's let's go crazy like let's let's play fast Let's let all these guys, like Kelvin Johnson and Lonnie Walker in particular, are flying up and down the floor. Derek White is a is a is an active, fast player himself. Dejounte Murray is like all over the place. He's like a phantom apparating from one spot fifteen feet away to another spot. Let's go nuts and play them all together. I mean, look, Dejounte Murray this year, thirty four of ninety from three, thirty eight percent. He had made eighteen threes combined in his entire career. Lonnie Walker was around league average and had some big scoring games before cooling off a little bit. Keldon Johnson, we'll see. Um, we haven't mentioned, obviously, DeRozan is going to start in one of those spots. And, you know, he had, he's, DeMar DeRozan is like a metronome. He does what he does. 
Uh, Rudy Gay will come off the bench. Like, they, but I'm just excited to see all these young guys because, you know, the question you hear about the Spurs is, well, they have some in- interesting young guys. Are any of them even close to the best player on a great team? I think right now the answer is, is probably no. That doesn't mean the Spurs don't have anything. They have a bunch of interesting guys at positions where you need interesting guys. Their franchise pivot over the next two or three years in whatever direction it ends up being um, is one of the biggest storylines in the league. And I mean pivot from, you know, what does Popovich do? How do they fill the front court? All of this. And, and this is, I think they're going to be fun to watch in the bubble. The other interesting thing they did during the scrimmages, and we'll see to what extent this continues during the seeding games, is Pop kind of taking a hands-off role and letting his assistants take over, something he uh, occasionally accomplishes by getting kicked out of games during the regular season. But uh, it was more of a pri- more of a real opportunity to coach the team Pop, for Tim Duncan. And- Pop has to have an, a bubble ejection, and he has to have a <laughs> bubble like the instant um, the instant like cranky third quarter substitution where the starters come out flat and he just pulls everybody, calls timeout and pulls everybody 45 seconds in. We need one of those in the bubble too. The broadcasters mentioned it yesterday. He's, uh, you know, there's a few coaches that are wearing masks on the sidelines, even though they're not required to do so. He's been the only one that's been wearing like the full on like N95, K95, I don't know specifically what kind, but one of those style of masks. But it finally came off yesterday because he got upset about a call. So that's that's what it's going to require for Pop, I think. And they were, I mean, look, I, I, there's maybe there's just no point in recounting this. I mean, they were slumping towards the end of the season. Their defense had fallen apart. But again, like two of their, their entire, their starting power forward and center are not going to be there. It, it, I don't think they're going to make it. Your simulations would suggest that they're not going to make it. I just, I'm excited to watch them play. And that is why um, I drafted them. Yeah, and for people who haven't watched Jakob Pertl, I mean, I don't know where he ranks on those rim protection numbers you were mentioning before, but it's pretty high. Um, and... He's a good player. He's a restricted free agent, and he's going to draw interest. I mean, teams wa- teams noticed and teams watched. Um, so that's it for the Spurs. I don't want to spend any more time on them. With the number three pick in the Delete Eight, high, whatever you want to call these teams, the last eight draft you selected, and I would criticize you for this, Kevin Felton. I think this is an obvious choice. I might have selected them last only because their the analysis of them is too obvious. You selected the Portland Trailblazers. Well, you know, sometimes the obvious thing is the obvious thing for a reason, I guess, is is what I would say in defense of my pick here, which is, I mean, not only is Portland a team, the team with the most legitimate aspirations, I think, uh, of the teams in this group that aren't, you know, either guaranteed or very likely to have a playoff spot in terms of the bottom two teams in the East. Uh, but, you know, they've got an interesting lineup thing going on in their own right in terms of both Yusuf Nurkic, who hadn't played at all this season, and Zach Collins, who played the first three games, I believe, before shoulder surgery, both back in the lineup, probably going to start together. But we did see in one of the scrimmage games, they started Yusuf Nurkic and Hassan Whiteside together. Yeah, that's it's been funny to watch coaches do this. Like Quinn Snyder broke out the Tony Bradley, Rudy Gobert duo in one of their scrimmages games. They're like, all right, we're we're really getting nuts here. Um, But yes, to your point, the team that was probably most decimated by injuries in the entire in the entire league now has mostly, other than Rodney Hood, it's it's what 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 was intended to be its healthy roster. And like they're twenty nine and thirty seven. They've played two more games. This has been well documented than New Orleans and Sacramento. And they have a one thousandth of a percentage point edge, so that if all those teams tie behind Memphis, uh, they win the tiebreaker by virtue of this quirk. However, their schedule is um, markedly uh, more difficult, uh, particularly than the Pelicans. But like, they're just a whole. The reason I wasn't going to pick them is they're just a whole new team. I mean, the Blazers are now a whole into like this. The whatever the Blazers were is no longer relevant. Yeah, in terms of a where were we, that's definitely the case. I think this is more about where will we be in in terms of even if this run at 8th fall is short for the Blazers, we get a better sense of where they stand heading into next season when you know I think the expectations are going to be pretty high. I mean, this is a team that came into the year talking about going back to the Western Conference Finals, being better than last year's team. It was a pretty immense di- disappointment for them to end up where they did. And, you know, the injuries were a huge factor, but they weren't the only factor. This, this roster was 
was not as good as he in his deep as it was advertised by the front office as being coming into the season. And, you know, we'll, we'll get a better sense of where they are because one of the key decisions they have to make is on Trevor Ariza, who is not here, and they're going to try to replace him with some combination of Melo playing small forward and then Gary Trent Jr. playing alongside the Lillard McCollum backcourt. Uh, which is, you know, Gary Trent's had a very nice breakthrough second season. I'm so glad you mentioned Gary Trent. He he just, I mean, no one is going to be interested in what Gary Trent did this season. Nobody other than like crazy diehard fans notice. But like, if you're going to survive the NBA season and survive all these injuries, every team needs a Gary Trent to be called on from the deep, deep bench. And you know what? Like that dude can do some things. Like he can kind of create his own shot a little bit. He can post up little guys. He's solid on defense. And like, like, is he going to start at three for them? I, I I can't. I mean, Carmelo Anthony is not going to be able to guard opposing wings in 2020. I mean, I I, mean, I don't know what you do, but Gary Trent's good. I mean, he's he's a he's a decent role player. Yeah, I mean, I think he definitely finishes games for them, and I you know I think he's got a bright future. I'm also curious to see Anthony Simons because he was the guy, the second year guy that everyone came into the season hyping, is you know the breakout player for the Blazers. They gave him the keys as the backup point guard didn't bring a veteran on the roster so that, you know, Terry Stotts could take him out of the rotation when he slumped as he did. He wasn't very good this season, but you know, he's looked good in the scrimmages. He's the kind of player I think who might benefit from the just extra few months of, of maturity that, you know, guys got in this period. That's kind of in between seasons in a sense. I, I really, I thought Zach Collins became a really exciting player in the playoffs last year for them. Um, and was playing a lot of crunch time and, um, you know, there are always going to be when you're six eleven and you can protect the rim, and he can, and you shoot thirty three percent on a low volume of threes. The default answer is going to be, well, he's a center. And I just think, for stylistic diversity's sake, I am rooting for the Collins Nurkic front court to be a long term fit because I really like watching both guys play. I do think there is a world in which they kind of complement each other a little bit on offense. If Collins can shoot it a little better, Nurkic is a really underrated passer out of the post. Um, both. I mean, Nurk, Nurk is also a smart positional defender. The question is obviously going to be, can Collins chase around shooting fours and, and are you going to win that battle of the math? And I hope so because he's a, he's a smart, tough, he's got a little nasty to him too. I, I, I really like him and, the answer to these questions is always, well, he, he's a center. Zion Williams is a center. Everyone is just downsized into their in position. And one of the cool things about playoff basketball is sometimes sometimes the big lineups start, start winning a little bit more in the playoffs. It's not always like a small ball world. I mean, you know, we thought that about Ennis Cantor last year in Portland. Like, how is he going to be able to stay on the court in the playoffs after Nurkic got injured? And they did a great job. I mean, Terry Stotts has done a terrific job consistently of kind of hiding his players' weaknesses at that end of the court. You could say somewhat similar, I think, of Mello, who was badly exposed at the end of his Oklahoma City run in the brief period he spent in Houston and was probably in better shape and is now certainly in much better shape. But they did a pretty good job of hiding his defensive limitations. But it'll be interesting because it's a pretty big shift for them. They were below average in terms of the average height of their power forwards this season they ranked 20th in the league because it was you know a lot of mellow a lot of nasir little hisonia and now you know you're talking about there was only one team in the league during the regular season with an average height at power forward of greater than 610 that being dallas with porzingis and cleva there but they're they've gone the opposite direction also because now they've lost all their centers but now portland could exceed that if they actually play Whiteside and nurkic together in addition to collins that one that one I don't really see as a thing. That's a little, a little slow and a little beefy for my More taste. Um, you better your offensive rebounding rate better be like sixty percent with those guys <laughs> on the floor because you're not. It's not. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't see that as a viable thing. Uh, Portland's very first game out of the gate is against Memphis. Um, that may be the single most important game in the bubble. Uh, I think you wrote that today. Their next games after that are. At Boston. I love that the NBA has decided to keep at in there. At Boston, Houston, Denver, Clippers, Sixers. Can't quit the Sixers, baby. Uh, Dallas, and then the Nets at the end. Like, if they don't win that Memphis game, given New Orleans' schedule, it's very hard to see Portland ending up in a play in. And Memphis, yeah. by the way, we, we're not talking about Memphis today. We were, Stan and I did Memphis last week. Tyus Jones' injury, he's out for at least a week. Could That could end up being like four games for them because they have a back to back early on. Um, 
he was an he was an important part of their team and an important part of a bench that was destroying people for a lot of the season. They have Melton, they have Grayson Allen, but just keep just like keep a little ear to the ground on Tyus Jones. Let's move on to the number four. Unless you have any other Portland thoughts? No, I think we covered it. They don't have a hockey team, do they? <laughs> they they have a minor league hockey team, but not in obviously not in they NHL have team. a hockey team. Apologies <laughs> to the Portland whatever they're called. Um, Winter Hawks. I just don't follow minor league hockey. Uh, well, so will Portland fans embrace the Seattle Kraken, or because Portland and Seattle have a weird, you know, a weird thing yeah, going on? Yeah, because they haven't really even embraced the Seahawks. There's probably more 49ers fans down there than Seahawks fans, so I I doubt it. It's hard to, you know, hate the other team that much in one sport, or like the other team's fans in one sport, and then be side with them in a different sport. Uh, with the fourth pick in our Kevin Pelton made us do a draft by stealing the Orlando Magic draft. Uh, I selected a team that has. I was very nice. It was very nice of your system to give them a less than one percent chance <laughs> of making the play-in tournament, and that's the Phoenix Suns, who I, I think are going to be without Kelly Oubre Jr. the whole the whole time. There has been no reports that he's coming back. He's there, but he's not played, and they've been vague about it. Aaron Baines just got there after having a real bout with the coronavirus. Um, Dario Saric hurt his ankle. Uh, in one of the scrimmage games, and they started Cam Johnson at the four. Um, this is not so much. I'm not selecting them here because they have a chance to make the playoffs. They don't. Um, I just think if there's a team next season that is under pressure to get up to 40 wins and get up to 42 wins or get up to wherever it needs to be in the West to have a shot at the eighth seed, I think this is the team. And if you ask me to rank, who are the five guys in the NBA who are going to be the most important swing guys in the league in the next five or six years? One of them for me will be DeAndre Ayton, who obviously missed the first part of the season due to suspension. Um, kind of got rolling towards the end. I, his improvement on defense was astonishing to go from where he started looking, I mean, absolutely out of his depth to pretty competent this year. His offensive skill set is tantalizing all around. It has not been close to fully maximized. A lot of that falls on him and his shot selection, I think. But Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton, you like that's 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 interesting to me, particularly on offense. Everyone, I love Devin Booker. Um, I, I just you know I don't know how they're gonna. I mean, if if Saric is out and they're starting Cameron Johnson at power forward. They literally have no wings coming off the bench. They have like nine point guards and no wings and some big men. So I, you know, that's a little weird. But I just want to see Aiton again. I'm ready for more Aiton. I yeah, I agree that he's a, a really important swing player. If we're doing again, where will we be? Hopefully in December, whenever it is, we see teams again. He if he takes another step like he did defensively this past year, then he becomes like an elite defender. Probably it goes from from average to very good after below average to average. I, I we probably shouldn't count on that. That's that's not really necessarily a realistic thing. But you know, it made him so much more viable as a key piece of a good team as opposed to just someone who's kind of going to compile a lot of offensive stats, but maybe not make a lot of impact in terms of winning. Yeah, we tend to put centers in like these buckets of of types like there's the Jokic type which is not really a type he's a once in a lifetime passer but there's this sort of big man like Bam is kind of taking on that role too for for the heat the run your offense through this guy invert the offense there's the the dive and dunk type you know Gobert Mitchell Robinson Tyson Chandler probably maximized that or became the sort of archetypal example of that in Dallas and I think what's tough about Aiton is he doesn't have a type he can do a little bit of everything. I think if, if one day he should shoot threes. He has not shown much interest in doing that. He's a decent passer, um, and he he likes to post up. It doesn't always lead him to profitable places, but he can do it. And he can roll, and, and he can roll and catch and pass on the move and do all of that. It's sort of just like he's a jack of all trades and master of none, and a lot of his, a, a lot of his career and – Phoenix's question going forward is, you know, it's cool that you can do everything. Like, that's great. That 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 versatility is huge against the best teams. Which way is he going to lean? Like, what are the, what are those skills that he's going to lean into? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm fascinated to find out. I mean, I think there's a sense in which it's almost kind of a negative if, you know, you, 
if you can do two things equally well, but one of those things tends to be more valuable for the team, and maybe that's the the rim running, the the dive center as opposed to the pick and pop or, or play at the elbow or whatever. And if that you know detracts from him being able to play that role, everything else he can do, then maybe to that sense, even though obviously in a vacuum you'd rather have the more versatile player than the more one dimensional one, maybe that becomes something of a negative. Now I think the other question is how much is that a product of the roster around him? Because of course. you know Ricky Rubio did develop that kind of chemistry with Rudy Gobert but you know if you're you're choosing the number one pick and roll point guard you want in the league he's probably not at the top of that list and I think it's interesting you know Monty Williams talked during the layoff about wanting Devin Booker to have the ball more in his hands even th- next year than he point did this book. year that's what the Suns fans call it point book yeah so how do you, how do you accomplish that who's the right compliment to him does that mean you play Kelly Oubre and the guy I wanted to talk about was Mikhail Bridges who was the uh, the number two most valuable player in the scrimmage games, according to my uh, wins above replacement player metric. Like he was out there just making everything he shot during those three games. Well, what I said about Aaron Gordon, I, it goes for Mikhail Bridges. He is the kind of player who will be able to be on the floor in the NBA finals if he's your fifth option on offense, because he does everything you want out of that player type. He's longer than my office. If he spreads his arms out, he'd probably be able to hit both walls in my office. Um, he's shooting threes okay this year. That's the one that's got to come up. Showed a little bit of aggression off the dribble, like pump and go and make the next pass. Can defend lots of positions. That Rubio, the Rubio Booker Cam Johnson eight in lineup is like plus 20 in only 35 minutes or so. Just that construction, that three wing, whether it's Booker, Bridges, Ubre, Booker, Bridges, Johnson, Booker, Ubre, Johnson, that just makes a lot of sense. And obviously, like you said, the point guard is a big question. Is Rubio the best fit for that? Maybe, maybe not. He's a tricky fit. Hell, you can just play all of them together and play Booker at point guard, those three wings, and Aiton. I don't. You may, maybe you'll stop. I mean, Aiton is even a guy like he might be able to switch a little bit on defense too. Like you just don't know what schematically is the best. But I'm with you. Mikhail Bridges is good. He's going to be a winning player. I, I was intrigued. Hollinger gave him consideration for his all defensive teams. Was he someone you thought about at all? Because he didn't really come up for me. I think he's, I really like him, but I still think he's a little limited as a one on one guy because of his lack of strength. That was a step, a step too far for me. I considered him more for six man of the year than I did for all, all defense. He didn't make my ballot for six man of the year, um, you know, for whatever reason. But I, I really like him. And, you know, I've talked a lot about Devin, but where are you on Devin Booker? Coming around. I mean, the comment I made earlier about Aiton making a huge step in terms of going from guy who gets numbers to guy that helps you win games, Devin Booker did absolutely did the same thing this year. And, and look, obviously, all those tools were there. I think a lot of it was just getting uh, a good situation around him, you know, so that it wasn't like a completely hopeless thing. And, uh, you know, if everybody else is pulling in the same direction, then it's going to be a lot easier, I think, for Devin Booker to pull in the right direction, too. I like Ubre, too. I have a soft spot for guys, again, with a little bit of nasty, a little bit of bravado to their game. That guy trash talks everyone after anything he does that is remotely positive, and I love it, and, and, and it's fantastic to watch. The thing for him is, like, he's he's one of those guys who feels like a shooter and hasn't really been a shooter. He shot 35% from three this year. That's the best of his career. That's right around league average. Like, that's another one. Like, I think... I think he's a good player. He may be a little overrated on defense, gets backdoored quite a bit, but he's good and he has the tools and he's feisty and he can do a little bit of catch and go and this. I just like, this shot just needs to get a little better. And if it does, like, they kind of got something. And you know how Robert Sarver is. Like, if he thinks they kind of got something, the pressure is going to be amped up next year. And I don't think that's unreasonable. Like, I, I, I think that's a team... And again, the West could be absolutely loaded next year, so it's hard to really peg anybody as a team that should make a leap leap. But I think Phoenix has the goods to make a little bit of a mini leap next year for sure. I agree. And I think this sense that, like, you know, as as you've talked about on the podcast, yes, 14 or maybe all 15 teams going to next year in the West realistically – or or hoping that they're going to make the playoffs and maybe 14 and 15, it's realistic. But – Teams are going to fall out due to attrition. I mean, Portland came into this year, you know, if not a playoff lock, at least someone that you thought was going to be right there in the mix. And then they suffer some injuries and drop out of it. The Warriors suffer injuries and drop out of it. Like the the field is always going to thin. So, you know, maybe that is the Suns that are one of the teams that end up thinning out. But 
you know, maybe they stick around and benefit from that. And the field could thin by trade, too. I mean, Oklahoma City is sitting there as a very prime candidate to trade its way out of that field and trade its, trade its way up to the line. I mean, I'm not saying they will, but they have like it would be very easy for them to flip that whole roster upside down and just say we're we, we are rebuilding uh, for for a year. OK, that's enough of uh, the Suns. Very excited for the Suns. Uh, by the way, Cam Johnson's pretty good. Uh, they got made fun of for that pick. And I don't. I'm not a draft. I, you, well, I'm not a draft Nick. And like, even if he's good, if you if you picked him 15 spots too high, there's an opportunity cost to that. Even if the pick is decent, I mean, it's like, he's never going to change your life. He's not going to be a 20 point scorer in the NBA, I don't think. But he can shoot. He can really shoot. That was as advertised. I I thought people talked about him like he was a stiff. He couldn't move. He couldn't dribble. Like. He actually moves his feet okay on defense. He's pretty long. Like I, I really liked what I saw um, from Cam Johnson. Yeah, I thought he was going to be a mo- bit more one-dimensional than he proved. You, you knew that he could shoot it, but it was the everything else. So, uh, did he go? He went ahead of Tyler Hero. I think that would be the one guy that you know behind him that you'd really say you'd, you'd probably rather have another guy. Time. I really like talk about bravado and 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 a little nasty Tyler Hero. I really like Tyler Hero. Um, maybe Brandon Clark too. Brandon so, Clark, I, again, I don't know how the draft. I don't. I don't watch these guys in college much. Like I don't. That guy's just a flat out basketball player. He's good. Um, okay, let's go on to the fifth team in our uh, Pelton mandated draft. You another selection where boy, I just I just smiled because I had I didn't want this team and I wanted the team I took after them because to me they're just a shoulder shrug now. They're just a shoulder shrug and and not not all that interesting one. Um, that's the Indiana Pacers. Why did you select the Indiana Pacers at number five? Well, partially because we're down to the fifth pick in an eight-team draft, and at least two of those. The, <laughs> the last two not, picks are pretty rough. <laughs> we got to we got to Mr. Irrelevant territory pretty quickly at this point. Now, I, I the, the thing I came up with is interesting about the Indiana Pacers is what we're going to see from Miles Turner here, assuming that DeMontis Sabonis, after leading the, leaving the bubble to seek treatment for his plantar fasciitis, Seems unlikely he's going to be able to return this season. Maybe he will, but you know now Turner is back in that role of primary big man. He's probably going to have a lot of spacing around him. Uh, they started T.J. Warren at the four in their last couple of scrimmages and and really went small uh, with those lineups. And those are lineups that facilitate Miles Turner being a really good player. Uh, it's fascinating this season without Sabonis, according to NBA Advanced Stats, his usage usage rate went up from 14 percent of the offense to 23 percent. It's a huge difference. He doesn't really have anything to do other than spot up when Sabonis is on the floor because Sabonis is just too good of a passer and a screener and not a good enough shooter to run the offense any other way. And you know, they played actually I was I, I was a big doubter of the Turner Sabonis combination. I didn't think it would work. They I think they're like plus one or something per hundred possessions, plus one and a half or two. Some small number, but like they tread water with those guys. It worked it worked better than I thought. And Sabonis defending fours doesn't seem like a thing that should work as much as it does, but like they're pretty they've been pretty much fine. It was nothing spectacular, but it certainly wasn't anything that suggested we need to break this up and trade one of these guys immediately. Uh, What's interesting, though, about Turner is not only does his role in the offense get larger when Sabonis goes to the bench, his efficiency gets better, too, because... One of the issues with Miles Turner has been is as good an outside shooter as he is for a big man. He still has a tendency to stand like 22 feet away from the basket instead of 24 feet away from the basket and shoot a bunch of long twos. Uh, he, when he played with Sabonis, he took more two point jumpers outside the paint than he did shots in the restricted area. Ooh. When yeah, when Sabonis was off the court, he had two more than two times as many shots in the restricted area as two point jumpers outside the paint. Uh, I'm looking at the numbers now. Uh, 431 minutes with Warren and Turner, but not Sabonis. So those are your Warren at the four, Turner at the five lineups, basically. Pacers about minus three per hundred possessions. Pretty bad on offense. So that that's a TBD. Uh, obviously, we, we also well Jeremy Lamb's out. Let's Jeremy Lamb's injured. Um, Oladipo, I, the it's like as the world turns. I have no idea if he's playing or not. He's played in the scrimmage games. He wasn't going to play. Now he's maybe playing. Obviously, if he plays, um, that's a game changer, although he was pretty frigid, predictably so, from the field when he came back from a very traumatic injury. Um, you know, as it, look, they're going to make the playoffs. It, it seems obvious that they will fall to sixth, given Philadelphia's schedule. Uh, but Miami also has a pretty tough schedule. 
And your simulations actually were a little friendlier to the Pacers. I think they had a much higher percentage shot of not falling to the six than I expected. It was almost 50-50, wasn't it? Right, yeah, and similar between them and Philadelphia, which I think gets back to the same thing as that Brooklyn Orlando thing that just in eight games, there's a lot of randomness. Um, and, and, you know, those, those, the, how those four, five, six seeds play out is a big, big deal in the East. Not quite as crazy as how three to seven in the West is going to play out, or in three to six specifically. Um, but, you know, I, you want to get into that four or five series. We've talked about that, even though it puts you in the Bucks bracket. Hollinger, I thought, made a great point today about are the Bucks going to be rusty in that second round? Because they're going to, they don't have anything to play for now. They're going to just absolutely destroy whoever gets the eighth seed in the first round. And then they're going to be faced with Philly, Miami would be my two bets in that order, probably. Like, that's a real team with real matchup advantages is too strong a word, but some tools in the Giannis toolbox that a lot of teams do not have. Um, and I think, so even though you're in Milwaukee's bracket, I think you want to be in the 4 or 5 series if you, if you can. Because I think Boston is just good. Boston's a good team. I would take no pleasure uh, in facing them. Um, let's go on to my pick. Sixth, I can't believe these guys fell to six. And really, there's no other option here, Kevin Pelton, except to take the Sacramento Kings, who I don't know why no one is talking about them. Maybe your projections told me why. They are 28 and 36. They have the same record as the Pelicans. Their schedule is Spurs winnable, Magic winnable, Dallas maybe. Why not? Let's get hot and beat Dallas. Pelicans, huge game. You're going to be underdogs, but huge game. Brooklyn, win. Houston, probably a loss. Uh, New Orleans, again. So you have the opportunity to beat the Pelicans twice and win the tiebreaker head-to-head because you have actually played the same number of games as the Pelicans. And then Lakers, last. We don't know if how you know Stan Van Gundy and I sort of disagreed on how. He, I thought he made a great point. Everyone assuming the Lakers will just sit their guys in that game. He thinks teams are going to kind of ramp up as they go, because it's been so long. I do think that last game, though, that very last one could be different. I think that could be a sit-down game. Your simulations were also cold on the Kings. I look at their schedule. You know, Obviously, they don't have Marvin Bagley. He really wasn't on their team anyway this year. They started rolling when they put Buddy Heald off the bench. He would have won six man of the year, maybe, had he been off the bench all year. Um, uh, you know, they Rashawn Holmes is out of is out of delivery food quarantine, and... and um, I, I, I think whatever the projection systems, I think those, I think that we're underestimating the Kings. I think this is a dark horse to get into the plan. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm probably not as high on them. I mean, I think, you know, they've. We'll see what what they've got because we haven't we haven't seen this group together a ton. Rashawn Holmes was injured at the end of, or he might have come back right before things shut down. That was like several years ago, so I can't remember exactly anymore. But it's been a while since we've seen this exact group. Harrison Barnes was also late getting into the bubble. and that That's uh, the thing that worries me is they've had um, some unfortunate health uh, and virus issues with Harrison Barnes, Jabari Parker, Alex Len, I believe, um, yep. who's on the Sacramento Kings. That's the thing. Um, um so that that does – I'm not going to lie. that And Holmes missing a lot of practices and stuff because of the quarantine. That, that – you're, all right, you've already talked me out of the Kings. I still stand by my sixth pick, though. I, I assume we were going to talk about De'Aaron Fox, though, and just how well he was playing the last month of the season or so. Yeah, he, um, you know, they had that weird season where, like, they still are, like, 23rd in pace or something, which does not seem like a way you would want to play if you have maybe the fastest player in the entire NBA on your team. Um, but, you know, you put him with Bogdanovich, Barnes, Bayelitsa, and a rim-running center— Got a lot of spacing on the floor. That's a good little ecosystem for him. I'm a big believer in De'Aaron Fox. I, I just like. I think he's a, a good locker room guy and a really good player. Um, that starting lineup, by the way, the one I just named, has played six minutes the entire year. Um, and if you just isolate the Fox, Bogdanovich, Barnes, Bayalitsa, those four, the Kings are minus 17 in like 300 something minutes. But then you look a little deeper. Those four with Harry Giles the third at center are minus 56 in like 140-something minutes. So that means the other lineups with other centers with those four are doing quite well. Um, so Holmes is a big reason for hope. And Bealitza at center was a massively success was a massively successful formation for them. I think we'll see that again. I just think this team, like Kent Bazemore kicked ass for the Kings. Like out of nowhere, Kent Bazemore started like posting up dudes 
and getting to the line. It was a really good bench player. I don't know. I, I maybe I am getting sucked in, sucked in a little bit. But I'm telling you right now, we'll know after the first two games if they if they even if they go 0 and 2 against the Spurs and the Magic. Obviously, they're done. They probably need to win both of them. If they're 2 and 0 after those two games. I'm getting hyped up for the Pelicans Kings showdown in Game Four. I, I would say my I might have been more excited about the Kings if Marvin Bagley had been playing. Like he's had just such a lost season, and to ha- suffer another foot injury in the practices leading up to this restart was such a bummer and kind of kind of typical of the way this Kings season has gone, really. But I also think like if you want to win right now, it's probably better that Marvin Bagley is not playing as as great of a scorer as he yeah. is. And Mar- Marvin Bagley as a face up five is going to pour points. Onto the scoreboard, but if you want to win right now, like defensively, he's going to be really far behind. He played 13 games this season, I think. It it might not be a bad thing that he's injured. I don't long term. Long term, obviously, they need him. They uh, they passed on quite a great player to take Marvin Bagley. Um, so anyway, um, I I think I'm I'm not gonna I'm not giving up on the Kings. They got two second round picks to take Kent Bazemore, by the way. That was like a sneaky little and Daquan Jeffries out of nowhere is killing it in the scrimmages. I'm I'm gonna watch a lot of Kings. You can't talk <laughs> me out of the Kings. I, I had to cut him off. I posted the top twenty in wins above replacement player in the scrimmage games, and he fell off. I originally had the top twenty five. He's number twenty three. Daquan Jeffries? Yeah, Daquan Jeffries. Who's yeah. on a two who's on a two way? Um a two-way contract, I believe. Um, I don't know. They win those first two games, Kings Mania. And this is the longest. What is their playoff drought out now? 14 years? It's the longest in the league. Once Minnesota it's, got in, that was the long, it's a long. It's been a long time. I think it's the longest. The second longest in pro sports after the Mariners, right? I can't believe them. How has that happened? Uh, the Mariners were like kind of a juggernaut for a while. And now they just... Then they have King Felix. They never made the playoffs once when they had King Felix on their team. Not not one time this year. This year, there's you know 16 teams make the playoffs in baseball, and uh, you know assuming all of them can actually complete their seasons, the Mariners will probably not be. How should this. I feel about the Dodgers guy who threw at the Astros people and then made funny faces at him? Throwing at someone's head is a little dangerous, but at, at least one of them was a curveball, so that mitigates a little bit. He claimed wildness, like oh, I'm just wild. I love when you establish a bi- <laughs> pitchers like establish a baseline of wildness, and then just like throw at people left and right. I, I I enjoyed the theatrics of it. Ricky Vaughn had it right. If you if you don't know where it's going, then they can't complain based on where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of like the Utah Jazz. Like if we foul all the time, they can't call every foul on us. That was the Jerry Sloan. They're not going to call every foul. Just beat the crap out of everybody. Um, okay, you had the seventh pick in the draft. And I would say that there is a rather large drop off between the sixth and the seventh pick. You actually took a team that I would have selected eighth, seventh. So again, another W for this guy. Um, you took what is remaining of the Brooklyn Nets as the seventh pick. The Nets are thirty and thirty-four, I think, uh, in current possession of the seventh seed. Uh, I just have not spent one second thinking really hard about how they will do in the bubble because. I mean, so many of their players are not playing that it's it's not relevant to me. But, um, you know, as someone who's root, I'm rooting for a play-in tournament. We invited the Wizards. Let's have a play-in tournament. So let's we got to talk about these teams. So why in the hell did you pick the Nets? Chris Chioza? <laughs> Chris Chioza just lights your world on fire. You can't resist. Rodian's Kuruts. Musa, Look, the, my guy Musa. <laughs> Musa, the most irrationally confident player in the entire. Musa does stuff like. Like, even as he's trying it, you're like, dude, that is not going to work out. You're not going to pump and drive by three guys with a Euro step and dunk. Like, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, he's a little more limited in what he's trying to do that's audacious. But Nik- Nikhil Alexander-Walker's shot selection may be up there in that that rankings of audacity. Uh, yeah, I, I, I still think the, the Nets are a better team than the Washington Wizards is presently constructed even though they're missing, like, half the minutes that they, they well, played okay, this Well, okay, so season. they have, like, Karis Livert's good, Joe Harris is good, and Jared Allen's good. So you're starting from a foundation of, like, those guys are, like, legitimate starting caliber players in the NBA. 
Yeah, Levert's going to be an interesting one. He's got a lot of admirers around the league. I've not been one of them, and I particularly don't think he's ideally suited for the role that they're going to ask him to play when they have Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving next year, where you know he's almost exclusively probably going to be off the ball. Maybe he gets to like initiate a little more with the second unit if one of those guys, at least, or or both of them, is on the bench. Uh, and obviously they, you know, you can't count on them probably playing all whatever number of games it is we play next year. But this is the role probably that he's best suited for playing is like we don't have a lot of other talent. You go out there and get buckets and maybe it's not going to be inefficient, but it's going to be more efficient than whatever else we're going to try. Garrett Temple's also a solid NBA role player. I, I got to give him that. I like Chris Jones, actually. He's kind of feisty. He's, he's one of those feisty point guards. I, I don't mind him. Tyler Johnson is on the team. Uh, Timothy Luau Cabarro started games at Power Forward. I thought he actually had a kind of a sneaky. I, I haven't looked up his three point shooting in a while, but he was stroking it with much more confidence than um, than he ever has. And I think he was around league average. Yeah, thirty six percent. Like if TLC can shoot thirty six percent on a high volume of threes, he's going to stick in the NBA as a useful bench guy. Uh, but yeah, but maybe not as a starting power forward. And unfortunately, during the scrimmages, he went two of 16 from three. Look, don't. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm can I, tr- can I ask a mean-spirited question? Absolutely. When is the last time a team is bad is either this version of the Nets or this version of the Wizards made the playoffs? So there's an answer that maybe you could not have to go back very far because last year's Pistons with an injured Blake Griffin were you know, pretty uh, limited compared to what they were during the regular season, even as, in, as a 500 seed, eight seed. But I, I think the answer is probably the 2016 Memphis Grizzlies, the Grizzlies team that had like eight replacement players on their roster. They were basically like the Nets. They, they had a whole new roster for the playoffs. Uh, that's a good, I was going to say, it's going to be somebody in the East. I can tell you that much. Whoever the, we, whatever we ever were looking for a weakling playoff team, you can look to the East. Uh, that Bucks. The Bucks Pistons was not a fair fight in the first round. That was the Luke Kennard series. Talk about a lost season. Um, Luke Kennard looked like a really good player. I actually like Luke Kennard. I think he's got good feel. He can clearly shoot it. The Pistons drilled into him. Will you shoot when you're open? Like enough with this, you know, second guessing or slow release. So you got to speed it up. You got to shoot. You got to shoot off the dribble. It appeared to work. Then he got hurt and he never came back. And then he was like on the trade block reportedly at the trade deadline, which was an interesting one. Um, by the way. Uh, this is not about the Nets. I'm going to use the Nets section to talk about another team for a second. I I would um, I would be I'm going to be in trouble in Croatia because in the Spurs section I forgot to mention Luka Samanić, who has been playing in the scrimmage games and with a gaping Ooh. wide hole at power forward, he might actually play. He could, yeah. I I I think that we might see some audacity from him as well. If if so, oh, is he guy. is he is, you know. He's not shy. He's not shy. He thinks. He, I think he thinks. You know, I'm, if I'm on the court, I'm on the court to score. Uh, what have we missed about the Nets? Uh, Tyler Johnson's fro, whatever, whatever that is, he's got going on hair wise. That's been a fascinating thing. Is the guys who like didn't cut their hair during the entire stay at home period. There's some guys who look totally different, like unrecognizable. I went. Now. I went. For, can I just say I went four months without a haircut. I got my hair cut right before the NBA shut down, like maybe four days before. A bad, a bad mistake. Um, then I went four months without getting a haircut. Also, uh, well, and then it was when, when I finally got a haircut, which I did at my house, um, I, it was such a relief that I couldn't believe. I just had never, I just, the relief was amazing. Anyway, back to the Nets. Have we forgotten? Just keep selling me. Is there anything else to sell me on? We don't even uh, get Kenny Atkinson holding the don't the no fouls sign on the sidelines anymore. We we haven't talked about Jamal Crawford or no threes. It's no threes, not no fouls. Oh, Jamal Crawford! Oh my God, there it is. Yeah, he did not see any action in the scrimmage game. Somewhat surprisingly, I guess I don't know if he's still working his way into shape or whether they're not actually planning to play him or what the idea is there exactly. But uh, he is he is on this roster. I'm ex- I, I hope he plays. Jamal Crawford is beloved. There's a reason he's beloved. I love watching mm-hmm. him play. Um, did, and, and, you know, so I don't know. I just can't get fired up about the Nets. They just, it, it, they're just a, so few of their actual players. But some of the players they have are good. Um, let's talk about my eighth pick. I was very excited to get this pick. 
Um, the Washington Wizards, I picked last uh, only because they were left to me and I had the eighth pick. I would have taken them seventh. They are 24 and 40, uh, five games out in the loss column of the Orlando Magic, six full games behind the Nets. They have to get within four games of the Nets to force a play in tournament, which means they have to pick up two games. Their first two games of the bubble are Phoenix and Brooklyn. If they go 2 and 0, oh, we got a shot for a made for TV event like the NBA and professional sports worldwide has never seen before. A Wizards Nets play in tournament for the 8th seed in the East. I I would be very excited for that and we should all be rooting for it because let's just have fun. Let's go to the bubble. Like coaches were in polo shirts and khakis. Let's go crazy. Like, you know, uh, let's 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 break all the rules. I picked the Wizards for two reasons. Number, I would have picked the Wizards seven for two reasons. Number one, Troy Brown Jr. I'm a believer. I've always been a believer. I'm a believer in him as a good complimentary player someday. He was buried for a lot of this season, emerged from burial later in the season. There is no place to bury him now. He is going to start, and he's going to get to do stuff with the ball if the scrimmages are any indication. I just think he has a nice feel for the game. Every time I watch the Wizards and Troy Brown plays for five consecutive minutes, he does one thing. And this doesn't sound like a lot, but he's like one or two things where like, ooh, that's smart. That guy's smart. That was a well-timed cut. That guy's that, that, that pass was just like a little earlier or a little whatever, later even sometimes, than most players would have thrown. He's just a smart player, and I like watching him play. I also think for all the hits their roster has taken, Bradley Beal's not going, Bertans is not going, um... John Wall's injured or healthy but not playing. has missed the whole season with an injury. They're going to compete. They're going to play hard. They have some feisty guys on their team. Shabazz Napier, Rui Hachimura, Thomas Bryant, and Mo Wagner is like a legitimate, like, you can get 48 decent center minutes out of that. Mo Wagner sneakily had like a really nice season for them off the bench. He fouls the hell out of everything in sight, but he's a good player. Um I think Wait, they're going to be. Did you ever give him as the answer to the trivia question you posed on Twitter yesterday? No, enough people figured it out that all you had to do okay. was read the comments. Yeah, he drew 26 charges in 707 minutes. The league leaders in charges were Kyle Lowry and Montrez Harrell with 30 in like three times the number. But Mo Wagner just, he's drawing charges at the grocery store, I assume. He's getting in the way of people's carts, getting knocked over, um, and screaming. He's very loud, too. I, I liked watching him play. I think they're going to be competitive and feisty. Now, if they don't win those first two games, it's 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 it's, it's curtains for them because their next uh, are Pacers, Sixers, Pelicans, Thunder, Bucks, Celtics. Um, so that's my Wizards sell, Kevin Pelton. I would feel a lot more excited about the Wizards if they had either Garrison Matthews or my guy Gary Payton the second on the roster. But uh, Matthews, by all accounts, still I don't think he is in Orlando yet. He didn't travel with the team, and GP2 presumably was the player that got replaced when they signed. Uh, I don't even remember who they signed. They signed someone as a replacement, and we didn't know who, who was his substitute, and we didn't know who, who it was for. Uh, oh, Jared Udoff. So that's a, that's about where we are with the Wizards, is they're replacing players, and we're not even sure You know, why. you're right to bring up GP2. I even put him. I even gave him a, a sentence in my all-defense column yesterday because – whether he can do anything else well enough to stick in the NBA is unclear. That guy can defend at the point at the 99.99999 percentile for perimeter players. It is a freaking hazard to have the ball anywhere near that guy. He is a monster on defense. I really liked watching him play this year. One of the disappointments of my season is uh, at the G League Showcase in Vegas back in December, I conducted interviews with Kobe Carl and Gary Payton II about the fact that Carl was coaching Payton in the G League with the uh, the South Bay Lakers. And then literally the next day, Gary Payton II got called up to the Wizards. So I was like, well, I don't have a story here if they're not actively you know, on the same roster together. So that was a disappointment. Um, but it was awesome that he played so well when he did get called and, up. And I love... I don't know who coined it. Forgive me. I, I, I can't credit them. But the mitten, although it's soft and cushiony in a way that his game is not, the mitten is like a lesser version of a glove, but related. is It's a really nice nickname. I don't. I mean, he probably hates it, but I like it. I think that probably goes all the way back. As long as I've known who Gary Payton II was as a basketball player, and uh, I, I've known him with that nickname. I think they're going to be feisty. Obviously, Beal and Bertans have been their two best offensive players um, all season. 
uh, and, and Bertans was just firing away. We get to see hopefully some more Jerome Robinson. Isak Banga, like another guy, if he ever learns to shoot it, could be interesting. I think he actually shot quarter threes okay this year. Um, but again, if they lose those first two games, the rest of their slog through. If they lose those first two games, they're looking at a potential 0-8, in which case they will not be making the play-in tournament, even if the Nets go 0-8. If they both go 0-8, well, that's not possible. That's not possible. They play each other. If they both go 1-7, I don't. I just don't know what we should do. I, or like, if, the, if the Nets go 0 and 8 and the Wizards go 1 and 7 and their only win is against the Nets. That's that's the 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 worst case scenario, I guess. I think you need to have a like a, a different I don't know. I, I there needs to be there needs to be some stipulation that like Portland can move into the East. I mean, that was basically my idea was have the seven worst teams in the bubble, not not even take the Wizards and the Suns, take the seven worst teams, put them in a tournament for three playoff spots. Seed one to sixteen, or seed one to eight, and one to eight, whatever you want. And if you have to move a team in the West into the East this year to make it work, well, guess what? We're not traveling anywhere anymore. We're just do it. Um, that brought up a whole slew of fairness issues. I get that. You know, Milwaukee suddenly has to play the Pelicans in the first round or something. That doesn't seem fair. Um, but uh, yeah, that's. I, I don't. I mean, obviously, without Bradley Beal, they have no go-to guy on offense. So when the game slows down, that's going to be. It's going to be interesting to see how they score points. Maybe we'll get to see a lot of Rui. Going one on one, Rui. Rui can kind of bulldoze smaller guys if he gets a chance. I think it's going to be a lot of Shabazz Napier. I think this is going to be a good opportunity for him to uh, showcase his skills. Uh, are you still picking Milwaukee to win the title? I'm picking the Clippers. Oh, you picked the Clippers all year. Yeah, despite the fact that the numbers say Milwaukee, <laughs> I have a logical inconsistency there. No, Admittedly. it's like I've picked the Clippers all year. Yeah, the numbers say Milwaukee primarily because their path is easier in theory, right? I mean, that's why it's like they don't have to play with the other LA team um, to get out of the finals. I, I think Milwaukee's path is actually, and I've said this all year, I think whether it's the second round of the conference finals, they are going to be in a series. I don't think they're walking over the East like everyone thinks they, or the numbers suggest they will. I think whether, I think Philly could give them, you know, I like, just shake Milton. I think that's going to work. I think, it, shockingly, I'm, I'm optimistic about a Brett Brown lineup experiment. Shockingly. Um, I think that's going to work. I think Philly can give them some problems in the second round. And I think Boston and Toronto are just really, really good teams. Nothing seems fluky about their success. Um, they're very comfortable in their own identities. They're good two-way teams. I think somewhere in the – maybe the Bucks will prove me wrong. I think they're 2-2 going into a game five in one of those series, if not, if not both. What do you think of this lineup that Toronto has been throwing out lately? They've gone with the Siakam and small forward to start the last couple of scrimmages. And ostensibly, it could have been to match up with the Blazers because they were playing them in the second game against the Nurkic white side front court. But they stuck with that in their third scrimmage as well. I think it's not going to be a big tool. Like Nick Nurse, who is my pick for go to the year, pushes every right button. He likes to, he will do crazy stuff and it almost always works. That's a lineup they used against Philly last season in the playoffs against a bigger, a, t- a bigger, more physical team, uh, Ibaka and Gasol together, with with Pascal. It didn't work as it worked okay. I think they were minus a little bit with that group. So I think I think maybe we'll see it if the matchups dictate. But I chalk it up more to like they have a history of doing it here and there, so it's not quite the same. But it 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 feels like a cousin of the you know Whiteside Nurkic Bradley Gobert thing, like a thing we're maybe not going to see. It is one way to adjust for the fact that they they lost their entire starting wing combination from the championship team, and it did not did not miss a beat because, man, their top seven, top eight is just really good. Everybody's good, and and their depth outside of that was shockingly good. That's what I thought was going to be their undoing this year. Is like, yeah, you looked at that top group, it was still pretty good, you know, even if a drop off from last year. But you know, then you're playing an undrafted rookie, Terrence Davis, you know, uh, Chris Boucher, who I had always liked but had never been able to break through in the NBA. And then lo and behold, they just play those guys and they play really well. Rondé Hollis Jefferson, the captain of my yep. up team, just comes in and starts breaking stuff. If Rondé Hollis Jefferson came into your kitchen, you'd have like five broken dishes in about a minute. He just, his arms and legs would be hitting stuff and they'd be falling off the shelves. I, I have a very small kitchen. His wingspan might be close to the... And uh, I mean that as a compliment. I, I'm not in... That's... A, that's I, they got good minutes. Of that. Terrence Davis, I had him second team all rookie. I saw people... I, Put him on a couple people put him on first team all rookie. 
I, you did. You're raising your hand. That's that's closer to correct than not having him on your all rookie teams at all. He has to make an all rookie team to do that on a winning team. Like if Matisse Tybal is going to be on anyone's all rookie team, Terrence Davis should be ahead of him. Well, I had them both on my all rookie first team, so you see where my uh, my uh, tastes in defensive wings lie. Uh, both, both very, very good rookies. All right, KP. Well, thank you for, we didn't forget anybody, right? I don't want to like, we secretly forgot some team of aggrieved. I think that concludes. So where the hell were we? I got to all 22 teams, had to force it a little bit here at the end, but some of these teams, you just, you, 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 there just isn't 25 minutes of Nets content. I have to say, even watching the scrimmages, it's so weird that there are basketball games on tomorrow that count. It just seems... All of this seems so strange, but at, and and we talked before about how I've had this sort of overwhelming feeling of like dislocation of there. It's almost August. There are games. I'm not going to any of the games. They're all in these weird arenas with no fans. But when I sit down and I dial up a game to watch, and the plays look the same, and the players look the same, and the sounds are you know other than the fans are the same. It's like it feels very comfortable. It was very good to see it back, and I get I get. We've we've talked before about all the ethical issues about testing and health and all that, but I get why people um, I get why people want to see it. It felt good. I can't lie; it felt good to watch basketball. Yeah, and the basketball was better, I think, than I expected in the scrimmage games. I thought it was going to be really rough, but you know the shooting did take a little while to come around from three point range, but it wasn't like noticeably awful basketball at any point. And then, uh, you know, I, I posted about this this morning. I think teams shot like thirty seven percent from three in the last scrimmage game, so they may they may have gotten that solved. There are scrimmage stats on NBA.com. This is absolutely crazy. All right, well, KP, it's been good shooting the breeze with you about all these teams or many of these teams. It's good to see you. Um, enjoy the Kraken and uh, enjoy the games. We get some real games to talk about, and let's just hope everyone stays healthy, stays safe, and uh, NBA is coming back tomorrow.